Happy Sabbath. My name is Melissa Basket. So, we're on the right track. Um, today, we're going to do a little bit of a, a winding road about thankfulness. Uh, so, either grab your seat and hang on or um, pinch your neighbor to keep them awake. We'll see how it goes. Would you pray with me? Father God, we ask, Lord, for your presence. We pray, Lord, that in every space of this building, in every space of this room, in every space of each heart, that your words are able to permeate and to penetrate deep inside of us to bring about real change, Lord, to help us to become the people that you've created us to be. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So I liked this cute little video we're going to start off with. So I'm off the hook for a sec. So who wants Thanksgiving toast? <laughs> this sounds awesome. Um, we are having the Thanksgiving meal after this, so I hope that you'll stay and join us. So this time of year especially, we tend to focus on being thankful. I'm actually a little surprised I haven't seen on Facebook the whole 30 days of thankfulness. Maybe my friends aren't doing it, or maybe Facebook has messed with my feed enough so that I just don't see the ones that are doing it. But usually it's, you know, like every day in November, we say something we're grateful for, and it's a really good exercise, right? But may I suggest that in order to be truly thankful, we need to unpack a few things that do get in the way. And it often starts with problems with our expectations. So, have you ever met Super Mommy? Super Mommy has got her baby on her hip. She's classically dressed. Somehow she manages to have no spit up on her clothes and her other children are dressed and their hair is all combed and washed and faces are clean and hands are clean and they look proper to leave the house. This mommy also cooks her own meals from scratch and feeds them to her family and they are nutritionally sound. In fact, they are organic and have no GMOs and are cooked to the proper temperature, and they are ready the moment that her husband steps inside the door. Have you met her? I'm just curious because I'm pretty sure that if there was a person like that, I would want to be her. <laughs> if you've ever come to my house, you'll understand, oh, I didn't even mention the clean house. House is fully cleaned. She doesn't have a maid. She does it when the kids are resting, whatever that looks like. Uh, yeah, exactly. This is kind of a big fat joke. I'm pretty sure there's nobody that does all the things all the time perfectly, except Jesus. So. so then, okay, moving on. You guys know about Superman, right? He's awesome. He's classically good looking, they say. Nothing compared to my husband, of course. He's got the muscles. He swoops in and saves the day. Uh, and somehow manages to always do it exactly in the nick of time and manages to somehow hold down a regular job and not get fired. That's debatable. And generally does all the things that should be done when they should be done. So have we ever met Superman? No. Unless you count Jesus then. And even he didn't do all the things that we have those expectations, right? So if, if we put the Superman cape on the person that we know as Jesus, he would have arrived at Lazarus' tomb in the nick of time to save him, and Jairus' daughter in the nick of time to save her. I wasn't on his timeline. So that's an expectation that perhaps is a little bit outside of what God's plan for us is. Okay, how about our super Christian? You guys met super Christian? It's possible you've met somebody who seems to be super Christian. There's always the Proverbs 31 woman, should we all not think of anyone off the top of our heads. Um, you know, the one whose husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all 
the days of her life, which means to me that she doesn't even nag him ever. Um, she selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. Um, she gets up while it is still night, provides food for her family and portions to her female servants. She considers a field and buys it out of her earnings. I don't even know what that means. Um, she sees, let's see, her lamp does not go out in the night. I'm sorry, does that mean she doesn't sleep? I'm curious. Okay, let's move on, because she's like amazing. Um, when it snows, she has no fear for her household. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She is clothed with strength and dignity. I don't know what that looks like, but I think it's kind of amazing. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. These are starting to sound a little more attainable for me. Just if, you know, if God is going to work through us, then we can do that, right? He can equip all of us. This one I'm still crossing my fingers on. Her children arise and call her blessed. I'm waiting someday, maybe. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, many women do noble things, but you surpass them all, this Proverbs 31 woman. Okay. So, again, have not met her. Lots and lots and lots of devotionals and studies and sermons have been preached about this woman who seems so amazing. I just want to be her best friend so she can also take care of my house. <laughs> okay. So how great then am I? Um, am I super me? So if I hold myself up to the examples that I just gave you, I'm feeling pretty inadequate, maybe even a little bit low and depressed. Because the truth is, is that when we were growing up, nobody told us, grow up and be mediocre. You grow up and just, just try and hit the, hit the mark. Just be part of, part of the average, right? I'm hoping nobody grew up hearing those things. I'm hoping that there was at least someone in your life that spoke to you and said, you can do great things through God's strength and through God's work in your life. So again, our aim and our desires don't always hit that, right? But we were told. We were told that. Now, incidentally, my brother um, thought when he grew up, when he was little, really little. He was certain that he could grow up and be an Indian, a Native American. So that when I grow up, I'm going to be an Indian. That's what he thought. He thought he could do that because, you know, a lot of, a lot of grown-ups just even leave it really general and say things like, you can be anything you want to be. In fact, if you've ever heard of Blue's Clues, there's this little part or little song that um, Steve, the original Steve, um, talks about, you can do anything or you can be anything you want to be. So maybe my brother could have grown up to be an Indian, but he didn't try hard enough. I don't know. And then there's all these excellent programs and books and leadership conferences and everything geared toward the vision of greatness, which kind of weighs heavy on me, the word greatness, because it's something that I think, whether we admit it or not, that's something that we strive for. We strive for that. And so these, these geared toward us, they have this great diversity and they, and they are made to meet the ever-changing criteria of the world today. And they tell me and anyone who is unsure that they are destined to be great. So what's wrong with the desire to be great? I mean, it gets us pretty far in life. It can really do a good number on, on our job, our career. We're striving to be great. We're hitting the marks. We're meeting the milestones. We're getting raises. We're getting promotions. I mean, that doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. So is it about being great? When we strive to be super in whatever we do, this can lead to a desire that becomes a need. And then that need can bring us to sin. Because James 1.13 to 15 says that... Um, no one, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Now, again, just trying to not blanket statement any, anything here, but our desire to be great can be detrimental. I mean, can we agree on that? 
It's possible that, that, our, that our vision and our, and our striving, in that striving, in that vision, that we lose something important. So it can be an, an evil desire. And then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So we want to be careful about what it looks like to be great. So Rick and I often talk about how things, and we've been talking about this for years. Here's the funny thing. We could talk all day and all night. We've actually done that. Um, I don't actually recommend it for anyone um, older than we were when we were dating, because that was um, when we were young. But um, a lot of those talks have, have been based around the concept that all the things that we do are come down to our motives. The choices that we make, the things that we do, we have a motive. And so it, that's where it can get tricky, right? Because we have to understand what's driving our actions. And actions are one thing, but what prompted them is the motive. And so we have to um, admit to ourselves exactly what it is that those motives are aiming us towards. Um, if we are trying to measure up to something that we think we are supposed to be or even already supposed to be, then where is our focus? Our focus is coming back, right? We're looking, we're looking back at ourselves. We're looking in the mirror. We're saying, have I reached the mark? Have I done the things? Am I doing the things? So... Uh, personal admission here, if you have met me, you probably already know this, if, you, if we've spent five minutes, but words of affirmation is my primary love language. Um, and I can live for long periods of time on the words of others and even their admiration. So when somebody tells me, you're doing it all, I'm just like, this is awesome, I'm down, I am. <laughs> it feels really good, and I, but I have to constantly evaluate my motives for why I'm doing what I am doing and to make sure that my focus is not on what other people think of me. Now, as God grows me, it gets easier to understand the difference and what is a healthy sense of affirmation and, and acceptance versus just the platitudes and the shallow compliments that are paid to people just in general speaking. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm perplexed when people seem to break themselves, uh, when they don't meet the mark, or haven't accomplished all that they feel they should have. I've come to learn that for some, this is good motivation to do better next time. For me, it's a recipe for depression. If I start to think, oh man, you know, or if, even if I hear somebody talking and they, they include me in the we, we should have this, or we really need to this, that's when I start to get stressed out. That's when my anxiety starts to go up because now I'm like, okay, expectations, they're coming, they're coming, and what am I going to do about them, and how am I going to handle that? Different personalities. So trying to hit both of those types of personalities there. If you're like me, though, it's all about the compliments or about the affirmation. Psalm 10.4 says, In his pride the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts there is no room for God. I'm just going to let that sit for a minute. If I'm spending so much time doing all the things, trying to get everything done, and I'm doing it so that people will notice and people will appreciate and people will admire me or what I've done, Am I leaving room for God in that? On a good day, yeah. Yes, I am. I can say that. And I praise God for that because that is a triumph that he has been working on. But there are days where I, I'm doing these things for good reasons. They are good reasons, and I'm not saying don't do stuff because it might be your pride. I'm saying, check your motives. Those motives come right back into all this play. And if we're thinking about how that's going to affect people's reflection of us, then where, where is the chance for them to know God if we are just so focused on that? 
Proverbs 13.10 says, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. So again, we're just touching on the pride thing here. This could be a whole another day's worth of speaking. Um, but if you think about it, when we're working in conjunction with God and we are letting him lead our days and we are allowing his Holy Spirit to speak to us and to prompt us to do the things. Now, there are times where I don't feel like helping a friend, but I realize they need me to. And that spirit, the spirit of God prompting me to say, you know what, Melissa, I've ordained this time for you to go and help them. The things that you were doing in this moment can wait. And you can go and do that. Or, conversely, understanding when their spirit tells me there are other people who will step in. I need you to make sure that you are taking care of your own house. You were taking care of your own family. You were doing the things because, again, I'm, I'm really prone to going to where that affirmation comes from. And I do get affirmation at home, and that is awesome. It's just a little bit different, right? And so, um, again, a lot of times when I'm speaking up here, it's also, for me, working out a, a process for me to learn and grow from. So a reminder that just because there are needs, doesn't mean that God has ordained all of the needs for one person to do. So if we're thinking, okay, how are we going to live that out? Because that's my favorite thing. It is, it's really hard for me when people bring this big, awesome idea and they just l- share it and lay it out. And then they're like, and we're done. Okay, I'd really like a few ideas. And, and, and I'm going to go a step further and say, especially in the parenting realm, like when I read a book or, or I listen to some teaching or, you know, I'm hearing stuff and they're all really great ideas. The concept is good. So when I get home or when I'm turning around and I'm going to talk to my own children... How do I transfer that concept into reality? Okay, so that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna talk about now. <clears throat> so this is my idea of what I know would be good for me, and I have seen it work for others. We start by carving out some EPC time with God. I had no idea what that meant, and I'm guessing only one of you (laughs) in here knows what that means. Extended personal communion. When um, we were when we were living in Southern California, Rick and I had uh, we've had many wonderful pastors in our life, but this particular one um, would would help the church plan retreats, and so we would go away to um, this amazing place up on the mountain in Malibu where it was completely, is that, I'm trying to remember what the name of that, anyways, um, away from all of the things, you could see the ocean from the hill, Um, you could see other houses like far away, but you were right here, and there were gardens, and there were paths to walk, and they had the steps to the cross path, I mean, it was amazing, And, and we would go there, and we'd have some teaching times, and then, after those teaching times, we would take a break, and, and the pastor would say, this is, now that we've talked about this, now we're going to have some APC time. We're going to have that extended personal communion with God. And I got to tell you, like, we're, le- you know, and he's like, okay, before we all go find our own little corners and spaces, you know, this is the window of time, it's a few hours. I'm going to spend a few hours doing what? And, and please know that when you go out there, it's going to probably be a little hard, especially the first few times, for your brain to kind of let all this stuff kind of... It's like going to sleep at night, people. You know, you got to turn the brain off. you got to kind of like, whoa, whoa, except for don't go to sleep for this, <laughs> where you have to let things be still. And so he said, so when that happens, and you just spend that time with God, it'll be something really amazing. And so... We went out and we did this, and I sat 
and had my own space and had my own time and kind of felt really awkward, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to expect. Is somebody going to, ex- like, are people going to be coming back with, like, these awesome nuggets of wisdom that were passed down to them in this special time? Are they, should I find a stick or a rock or something I can take back with me and, like, share a lesson or something that I've learned? And, and all of a sudden, again, I'm not even thinking about my time with God. I'm thinking about worrying about my time with God and what it should, should become. Just that whole super me thing. Like, I, I, I don't want to be, like, missing the point. All the people that are doing the thing, you know, like, they all seem fine with it. And, you know, my guess now, this has been years, my guess now is that a lot of them were still thinking, like, I don't know how this is going to go either, but I'm just going to go and show up. So, one of my life verses is the whole, be still and know that I am God. Um, in fact, I had a friend who um, gifted me the plaque from Psalm 4610 because she knew all those years ago that I would need that reminder, and I do. And so we spend that time that it takes to recognize God's leading in our lives, and we allow him to show us the trajectory on his timeline. Again, remember, God's timeline doesn't look anything like what, what we can even fathom. We have to understand that the way that he works through time is completely different, and his desires and his expectations for our serving and our loving and our giving and our doing are not things that, A, come naturally to all of us, and B, don't look anything like we think they should because, you know, we're looking for the good thing, right? This will also help us to remember that nothing we do can earn us God's love. Nothing we can do. That is done. That is done. He created us. He loves us. He died for us. That is done. All of the good works that are done on this earth, um, it was Paul that says they're not they're like filthy rags, which, again, really hurts my words of affirmation personality because I'm just like, what do you mean they're filthy rags? I have to go wash them too. <laughs> but that's not about that. We have earned God's love just because he loves us and he created us, not because of anything that we're doing, that we've done or haven't done. And this will lead our desire We want to follow his will. And when we do it because we know that it isn't about how much he loves us, then our motives can be a lot more pure. So we do this. We spend this extended personal time with God. We lay out our lives in front of him. We lay out our schedule in front of him. We lay out our relationships in front of him, and we say, okay, God, what do I keep? What needs to go? And in my experience, God brings those things to my mind when I've prayed, when I've asked with the right heart. And it's not hard to do that. It's hard to make the time. I I don't know. I managed to make time to brush my teeth. I think that when we start to put things into perspective, making time for God um, is imperative to every aspect of our lives, even though... There is, it's not like punching the clock at work. You have to punch in on time if you work at a place like that. I'm glad I don't. But there are schedules and there are expectations. And God doesn't put any of that on us. He accepts when we're willing, as we're willing, and always longs for more. So, extended personal time putting it all before God, allowing him to guide us, to lead us, to show us, to encourage us, to speak to us. Because I don't know how many of you have this super me thing going on where we just have so much on our plates and we're like, I don't know how I'm going to get it all done. I mean, even today, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, a couple weeks, you know, I, I know I'm on the schedule to speak. I know it's what's coming up, and I'm planning on what I'm going to speak about. Why don't I sign up and bring a couple of dishes to the potluck and then maybe not have anybody directly running that because 
I can do a lot. This is the facts are, I can't be here and back there in the kitchen, so thank you, Anne and Cora, back there in the kitchen. I know you can hear me for doing that. Um, but it is just exactly like that. Those are all good things. It's good to bring food to the potluck. I tried for many years to not feel bad for not bringing food to the potluck, and I always felt bad. <laughs> but I could have picked something easier, you see? The thing is, is to remember how our yeses affect God's plan for our lives and how they may take away or they may build up what he has ordained for us to do. So when we've done this, we start to recognize the siren call of the world, the world that places great value on what people do, how much they can do, and then continue to exert the pressure for more and more. The reality is the harder we strive to reach the standards of this world's expectations, the more we allow ourselves to be distracted from God's calling and purpose for our lives. And just a reminder, he doesn't say, therefore go and run around like chickens with your heads cut off. If we are ever to be fully engaged in his calling, we must realize that we are not meant to say yes to every good thing that crosses our path. I'm going to repeat that. If we are ever to be fully engaged in his calling, we must realize that we are not meant to say yes to every good thing that crosses our path. It is vanity to think that if we don't do this good thing, that it won't get done. Friends, the God who formed us from dust certainly does not need us to carry out his will or his plan here on earth. Remember, James says that our desires can cause us to be tempted, and that's what gives us birth to sin. So we need an antidote, right? Okay, we know, we know that we've got to spend the time. Now we need an antidote. And here we're going to look at one more clip, and feel free to take notes. So, we cannot be truly thankful for who we are, where we are, and what we have accomplished to date until we are willing to be still and know that God is God. I must accept that in order to be grateful, I need to be content with my life right now. And as for the caveat, which my dear hubby loves, this is not permission to stagnate either. We're not saying be content and just... I'll just leave everything the way it is. It's good. Rather, growth comes from recognizing where we are and where we want to go, where God would like to lead us. During hard times, we don't get through as effectively if we are always straining to see the light at the end of the tunnel instead of focusing on the next right step. When Kendron was in the hospital, you guys, if you've met us again for five minutes, you know our son spent seven months in the hospital after he was born. And, you know, honestly, so grateful. I had no idea how long that was going to take. And people keep, you know, they would ask. They'd say, so how do you guys do it? How do you get through this hard time? When is he? And my favorite question that I, I love to say um, drove me crazy. Uh, when are you guys coming home? <laughs> so not our choice. This is on God's timeline. This is on Kendron's timeline. And we just have to go with it. And they would say, how do you do this? How do you how do you not know when you're going to go home? How do you plan? How do you live? And we'd say, well, it's really by focusing on one day at a time. Now it's starting to sound a lot like recovery. Oh, that's right, because recovery is a part of every bit of life. All, of, all things are involved in recovery. We take the next right step. We do the next right thing. We make it through the next hour. We make it through the next minute. And when we are instead looking at our present life and not that light at the end of the tunnel, then we're able to receive the gratitude for what it means to have come this far. If you are so inclined to do the whole journal thing, or even just take some time today, take some of that extended personal communion. I mean, Saturday's Sabbath is a kind of a built-in. God gave us this day. He said... I'm, I'm especially available to you today. I mean, I can imagine if my kids 
if I set aside this whole day for one of my kids and said, this whole day is for you, they would take full advantage of that. They would say, okay. And, and honestly, Amriel would have it all planned out within like five minutes. She would have every minute planned. And Kendrin would say, let's play. And could we not do the same? Could we not recognize that God has built in this time to, ex- to spend with us? And this is not for the guilt, okay? Because I know that I, growing up, sometimes I felt like guilty if I wasn't doing something that looked like or felt like it was directly um, Sabbath-oriented, you know? Um, sometimes people feel uncomfortable with getting in the water, and, and I'm not knocking that, okay? Like, but if God is with us and he is spending time with us, I think it's okay to enjoy his creation and to spend that time with him and to let him to speak to us, to teach us, to grow us, but uh, more than anything, to show us Show us how to be grateful where we're at. Show us where we're going so that we can be thankful in the moment and in the present. So I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm going to go ahead and close this with a prayer. Father God, I just ask, Lord, that you forgive us for allowing other things to cloud our judgment for looking to things outside of you to show us who we are, to remind us that we're loved. Lord, I pray that you will encourage us, you will free us up to enjoy our time with you, that we can look forward to that, that we can seek that just as a child seeks time with their parent or we seek time with a special loved one. Lord, you are that loved one. I pray, Lord, that as we seek to spend time with you and as we do spend time with you, that you will speak to us, that you will show us, that you will lead us to the next good thing, Lord, and that you will show us how to be grateful and how to be thankful exactly where we are today, knowing that you are in every single aspect of our lives. I pray that you go with us today. In Jesus' name, amen.